people here at the monastery, our local support, even people far away are getting sentimental and nostalgic about the Sala, now that the word has gotten out that it's going to be torn down. And it is true that a lot of good has been done here. One of the more memorable events was when we had a visitor one time. He stayed with us for a couple months. Very troubled person. He'd been contemplating suicide ever since he was small. And his mind was like a ping pong ball and bouncing all over the place. And he was troubled by the story in the canon where the Buddha teaches body contemplation to the monks, then goes into the forest for a retreat. The monks start getting disgusted with the body. Some of them end up committing suicide or hiring people to, to kill them. The Buddha comes out and says, where is everybody? And then he calls the remaining monks together and teaches them that when unskillful states arise in the mind, you should go back to breath meditation. It will clear them away, in the same way that the first rains of the rainy season clears out the dust of the dry season. And this person was troubled by that. How could the Buddha be so ignorant? How could he really be Buddha if he would do something like that? He had asked many different Dharma teachers and never gotten a satisfactory ex explanation. So he wanted to ask Ajahn Suwat, so we arranged a meeting for him one afternoon. It was about four, and John Sweat was sitting where I'm sitting right now. I was sitting where the monk next to me is right now. Fred, the guy, was sitting right in front of him. If you drew a line between him and a John Sweat, it would go all the way over to the heater over there. And we had a woman visiting us. She was a regular, come up every weekend. She wanted to see what a John Sweat would have to say. So Fred asked the question, did a John Sweat know of this t story? John Swat said yes. Then Fred asked, Didn't you have any doubts about the Buddha? Now the word for doubt in Thai is Song Sai. And that was so far from a John Swat's thoughts that he didn't even hear that word. He heard the word Song San, which means to pity. So he said, Yes, I had a lot of pity for the Buddha. Here he was trying his best to teach people, and there were some people he just couldn't get through to. So I had to correct him. I said, No, no, he didn't ask for about pity, he asked about doubt. He said, doubt? Oh, no, never. Then he focused on Fred and started talking. And he didn't let up in his talk, which meant there was no room for me to translate. And I, off to the side, could feel his compassion. It was palpable. Karen, the woman sitting in front of the heater, said she was pushed against the heater. It was so strong. And Fred was sitting there bathed in this, and he looked kind of startled. So John Sawat so talked like this for about 15 minutes. Then at the end he said, well, there's a lot that you still don't understand, but this, I'm afraid this is all the time I have. And so he left. And Fred's mind was calm for the next three days. But just the palpable nature of a John Sawat's compassion was really striking. That's one of many good events that have happened here. But we have to remember, like the nat nature of all dwellings, this dwelling is going to have to fall. In fact, it was originally designed to be taken down. It was put up as a temporary stopgap measure while we got permission from the county to build something more permanent. And as things ended up, what was intended to last for about five years has now lasted for over 30. But it's bound to fall apart. We can't let ourselves get sentimental or nostalgic about it. Because if we're nostalgic about something like this, how are you going to feel about your own body when you have to leave it? The Buddha talks a lot about dwellings, the body as a dwelling. Your life, out of many lifetimes, each life is like a dwelling. You go from one dwelling to another to another. And they keep falling down. You keep building new ones and moving into them. You take on the identity of a being in a particular world, and there you are, a house. But this house is built out of very flimsy materials, the form of your body, which is constantly changing, your feelings, perceptions, thought constructs, 
consciousness, things that are falling apart all the time. So we can't let ourselves get nostalgic about the body. We look after it so that we can use it to practice. But we have to find a better dwelling inside as part of our path. The Buddha talks about concentration as a dwelling. You enter into it and you dwell there. Like right now, you enter into the body. Focus on the breath, and then you try to stay. As far as you're concerned right now, the world outside the range of your body is irrelevant. You want to be totally involved in the world inside the body. When you breathe in, where do you feel it? When you breathe out, where do you feel it? And if you get really sensitive, you realize you can feel energy flow throughout the whole body. In the beginning, though, it's going to be more prominent in some spots than others. So you focus where it's clear. And then you ask yourself what rhythm of breathing feels comfortable. Longer or shorter? Heavier, lighter, faster, slower? Deeper, more shallow? Where can you settle in? Because you're trying to make this house into a home. In a place where you want to stay. In the beginning, it's a place to rest. But as we've learned in the past few years, you can also work from home. In fact, the most important work is the work you do as you examine what's going on in your mind when it's concentrated. But before you can do that examination, you have to get it well concentrated, because otherwise the, the thought of examining it might destroy the concentration itself. So try to make this a comfortable place to be. And you can make it an interesting place as well. Because if it's not interesting, comfort can get dull after a while. And you want to start wandering out. And when you wander out of this home, you're exposed to all kinds of things. So you give the mind things to play with. You could think about the different elements in the body, not chemical elements. These are more elementary properties. Fire, the warmth in the body. Water, coolness in the body. You've already got the breath, which is the wind element, wind property. And then earth, solidity. Where do you feel these different properties? Can you make the body feel heavier or lighter? Can you make it feel warmer or cooler as you need it? You might try focusing on the perception of warmth. Where right now is the warmest part of your body? Focus there and see if the sensation of warmth gets stronger as you hold that perception of fire in mind, and then you allow it to expand. Can you spread the warmth around? This is useful on a cold night like this. On days when it's hot outside, you focus on water. Again. Same principle, where the coolest sensations inside. Focus on those. Think of them as being water that can then spread around the body. Some people object that this is using your imagination too much, but then the whole point of this is not to see just things as they are, it's to see things as they function, or as the Buddha says, how they have come to be. The phrase jnana putta dasana, which is sometimes translated things as they are. There are many passages in the canon that indicate that that's not what the Buddha meant. It's more what comes from what. See how something arises. And the best way to see how things arise is to experiment. And you're going to learn a lot about the power of your perceptions in creating an interesting place to be at home. So it's as if you not only have a comfortable place to stay, but you've got some instruments like microscopes to look carefully at things. There are different sensors that pick up energies that you ordinarily don't see. They talk about how the songs of birds may not really sound like the way they sound to us, because there may be things that they're singing up above 
the range of our range of hearing. Now, physically, we can't get to those ranges, but mentally, there are a lot of things that you ordinarily can't perceive going on in the body or in the mind until you get the mind really quiet. Then you can perceive them. Your inner senses get more sensitive. And in particular, you begin to see how your perceptions shape things. As the Buddha said, perceptions and feelings shape the mind. So what are the feelings right now that are shaping your mind? What are the perceptions? Can you change them? When he talks about being mindful of feelings, he talks about feelings not of the flesh and feelings of the flesh. Feelings of the flesh are simple sensory sensations that are pleasant or painful or neutral. Feelings not of the flesh are things that actually come because you want to practice. They come about as a result of your intentions. The fact that you're paying attention and being alert to the breath can create some really pleasant sensations inside. So how do you change the sensations? How do you change your perceptions? And what happens when you do? This is how you learn about cause and effect. Because even this dwelling of concentration that you enter in, that you dwell in, where you remain, even though it seems very solid, egaka, quality of having one gathering place, it too is going to fall apart. As you stay with it, you realize you have to keep it going. Without that intention to keep it going, it starts blurring out. That's when the Buddha recommends that you start looking at ways of taking this house apart, demolishing this house, your passion, even for the concentration. You see that it has its origination in the mind, but also passes away. You have to keep causing it again and again. You see the allure that really is a very comfortable place to be, and it's much more solid comfort and sense of well-being or ease, pleasure, than you can get from sight, sound, smells, taste, tactile sensations. But it does have its drawbacks. It's like a house that's constantly falling down, and you have to constantly keep it in repair. I think of my father when I was young. He was a real handyman around the house, and every weekend there was always something to do, because there was always something going wrong. And some people will live in a house and just let things go wrong until they get really bad. In his case, he was constantly keeping it up. It made you realize if you're sensitive to having a house, you realize how much maintenance it requires. So it's not just a comfortable place to be, it's a place where you have to keep fixing it. When you see that, the mind tends to finally say, well, maybe what the Buddha says about this passion for fabrications is a good idea, worth listening to. Maybe it would be better to find something unfabricated. And so you look around. You don't want to leave concentration because the fabrications of an unconcentrated mind are even more burdensome. And so you think about that analogy the Buddha gave that time he was asked how he crossed over the flood. And he said, by not pushing forward, not staying in place. In other words, you don't stay in the state of concentration where you are, and you don't try to go anyplace else. And within time and space, those are the only two alternatives. So what's a third alternative that doesn't involve time and space? That's the question. It's only when you develop your sensitivities really well that you can see the answer. And that's when you don't have any dwellings at all. The Buddha does, however, sometimes talk about how the enlightened person dwells in emptiness, in empty of greed, aversion, and delusion. But it's not really a dwelling, because again and again the, the texts say that the enlightened person is everywhere released, fixated nowhere. 
the image they give is a light beam that doesn't land anywhere. Go out and look up in the sky. It looks dark to us, but there are lots of light beams going back and forth, back and forth. And when we have something like the moon, it will reflect the light that's there. But it's not the case that there's no light next to the moon. It's just we don't see it because there's nothing to reflect it. That's the image the Buddha gives of being everywhere released, established nowhere. So where we're going is outside of dwellings, which means that we have to have the right attitude to the dwellings that we take on. Try to create this inner dwelling, realizing that it too is going to fall apart, just like the body is going to fall apart someday. But you can get some good out of it. The fact that the cell is going to be removed doesn't remove all the good things that happen here. They're part of our karmic inheritance for those of us who have been here and done good here and experienced the goodness of others. So we appreciate the goodness that's been done here. We appreciate the fact that the sala has provided us with a place. But we can't get nostalgic or attached. Years back when we were building the, the jetty, which is at one of the spired monuments at the monastery where Dhamma said it, we didn't hire people. We had volunteer work. John Fung students from Bangkok would come out every weekend, the monks and some of the local people would work during the week. And when it was all done, a group of the people who had been working on it was sitting around talking about how much merit they'd anticipated. And John Fung walked by and said, Watch out. If you're attached to the jetty, you're going to come back and be reborn here. And who knows what kind of animal would be reborn in a jetty. You do good, let the good nourish you, because you don't get nostalgic about it, because you always want to keep on doing more good. So our hope is that we can build a new cellar and that more people can continue doing good there until it too has to fall down. But the goodness stays solid. Make that your inner dwelling until the mind reaches the point where it doesn't need a dwelling at all. <laughs>